Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by the Union Capital Corporation, Natel's Air Conditioning and Heating, a proud sponsor of the St. Jude Dream Home, and Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House. and welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we talk a lot about what's happening on the local sports scene. We'll talk about what happened in Atlanta when the uh, city of New Orleans was not awarded the uh, Super Bowl uh, in 2018, Super Bowl 52. Also, we'll talk a little bit about the New Orleans Saints, their draft, undrafted free agents. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the New Orleans Pelicans, uh, specifically Eric Gordon's role coming up in the upcoming season. Our guest tonight got a great panel for you. Both guys returning to the panel, Brett Martell of the Associated Press and Sean Fazan of Fox 8 Sports. And gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Certainly appreciate your time tonight. We always like to inform the listeners and let them know and the, and the, and the uh, audience uh, a little bit about what you guys are involved in. And Brett, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about the Associated Press and what you're doing. Sure. Um, uh, AP is a worldwide news organization uh, servicing all kinds of media, internet, newspapers, radio, and I'm basically the lone a uh, sports writer for AP based in the state of Louisiana and I work out of New Orleans and also travel to Baton Rouge a lot to cover LSU and anywhere else in the state where there may be a major event going on. Right. Also Sean with Fox 8 Sports and uh, of course football's year round but you guys are covering it all. You just, you just got back from Atlanta. Just got back from Atlanta, Fox 8, uh, 4, 5, 9 and 10 every night. Final play every Sunday at, uh, at 10.30. Uh, we're already starting our plans for football season because that's just what we live by. Yes. But uh, obviously, LSU baseball uh, doing big things right now. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into the summer months here, and then training camp will be here before we know it. Well, I tell you what, you're not kidding. A rookie mini camp last week, mm -hmm. uh, OTA is just right around the corner. And uh, we're in a situation where, especially in New Orleans, football is year round. Uh, I talked about it on my radio show. It was really a gut punch for the city of New Orleans. I think a lot of us felt that uh, it was a slam dunk. Uh, the tricentennial, the 300th anniversary of the city of New Orleans, uh, everything that we've done in terms of being a venue, uh, uh, destination for uh, major events, how we really pulled off the last Super Bowl with the exception of the blackout. Uh, all the cards seem to be lined up for, for New Orleans to be able to uh, host the 2018 Super Bowl. But along the way, it got hijacked. It got hijacked by, again, the city of Minnesota, who uh, has a brand new, spanking new stadium, about a billion dollars. Half that money put up by the ownership of the Minnesota Vikings, the other half public money. And the owners throughout the process talked about the fact that they felt they had to reward uh, cities that would build a new stadium. Uh, for a lot of us, we just didn't see it coming. And I think the whole city kind of took it a little bit personal. And guys, I'll ask you first, first of all, your impressions of what happened in Atlanta. Sean, I'll take you first since you were there. Um, what, what, was the, what was the vibe? Well, were you as shocked as everyone else was? You know, it, it's funny because I was there and when we got there, there, I read a lot of national media stuff on the way up, and uh, everybody, everyone in the national media was talking about New Orleans is the odds-on favorite. New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. When we got there, you sensed the excitement. Uh, they were so confident in that bid, uh, and then all of a sudden, when the bid came, at first off, it was a, it was a tense few seconds. With this day and age, with Twitter, and then watching it on, on the NFL Network, uh, we're right outside the Minneapolis store and in New Orleans. So we're standing right in the middle, and all we just go by the applause. And clearly, there was applause from the Minneapolis room. The New Orleans room went silent. So. It certainly was a feeling of, of disappointment. I think they truly felt like Minneapolis could do the exact same thing in 2019 as they could in 2018. But for 2018 in New Orleans, it's such a special year. And I really felt like they thought that was enough to override the new stadium. But clearly, look, it, it, the, the precedent has been set. New stadiums, you're going to get a Super Bowl. And ultimately, look, you could not have put on a better presentation. From what I hear from everyone that was involved, it was a flawless, phenomenal presentation in terms of the bid and in terms of the actual presentation itself with Rod West uh, and Stephen Perry, two great guys. And to, it, it, w it was a punch in the gut, as Rod West said afterwards. And it, was, it, it certainly was something that I think they were so, they were 10 for 10. Mm. They were 10 for 10 going in. When they were they finalists. Were, exactly. And right. they, they were so confident they were going to get it and when it didn't happen I think uh, it was a little bit of uh, a disappointment and a little bit of wow that really just happened and and then here we are 2018 it will not be uh, in New Orleans. Brett what can you add? 
Well, you know, I was wrong like a lot of people from here in thinking that New Orleans was the favorite. And, I, and you know, a lot of us are biased because we've experienced how, how well Super Bowls are run here. But um, as soon as I started thinking about it after the vote and trying to use the benefit of hindsight, um, it struck me that really New Orleans was facing an uphill battle as soon as they ended up as a finalist with Minnesota. As soon as they, because the, the problem is when you think about $500 million in public money for a new stadium in Minnesota, and how hard, if you followed, how hard it's been for them to get out of the Metrodome. Yes. And they finally have this committed after a lot of work, a lot of years of work and ownership change and everything going on with the Vikings. The owners, it's a risk to tell Minnesota, to actually tell any community, you can do all this work to get a billion dollar stadium with half funded by public money and you still might not get the Super Bowl on your first bid. Yes. Um, and uh, that would be, telling every other community where they're hoping to get public money invested in stadiums um, that you could do it and not get, you know, right. not reap the- Not get rewarded. Not get rewarded. And so, um, and I kind of thought about it also in terms of the NBA. You know, when you think about why is the NBA in New Orleans and not Seattle? Mm -hmm. All, you know, with, with people using common sense saying, New Orleans not a basketball town, George Chin, you know, doesn't have the money, the team's not doing well, they're right. gonna move, right? And common sense said that the team's existence here was very tenuous and that Seattle was a great basketball town with a great history and should have a team, but you know what? Seattle didn't do anything arena-wise, and the NBA asked them and asked them and asked them to do it, and finally when they had the chance to abandon Seattle, they did. Right. And they, but the NBA came and gave New Orleans chance after chance after chance to get it right, mm -hmm. which they've finally done now right. with the current ownership, and I think that that's just how business operates. They reward public investment in their product. Uh, there's been a public investment in this product. Yep. Yeah. 475 million since 2005 has been put into the uh, in, into the dome. 15 million of that came from the uh, from the NFL. Mm -hmm. 158 million came from FEMA. The rest of the money came from taxpayer dollars. So again, we've we've done our part in in terms of retrofitting that stadium and trying to make that stadium the the most modern it can be. Let's face it, it's the same shell. It's a it's totally different. It's totally modernized on the inside. Uh, the big question is is will this stadium still be um, still be looked at as a modern stadium when we get the chance to do it again? More than likely, 2019, Atlanta Stadium will be online. They'll get that Super Bowl. So we're looking at 2020 to 2023 to 25. Again, you got to also look at the parameters on this. Saints lease runs out in 2025. NFL does not want to award a, a, a Super Bowl to a city unless they've got an ironclad lease with the team long term. So the question starts to be starts to ask is number one, okay, we've got a brand new building for the most part. We've done our part, but what will it look like in nine years from now? What will it look like? What will it look like nine years removed from from the first tile, from the first renovations that we did and the aftermath of Katrina? And I think that's what what has people scared, has them worried about the opportunity to host another Super Bowl here, uh, because quite frankly, the state of Louisiana cannot afford to blow up the dome and start all over again. Well, those are, you talk about 2025 with lease agreement, I, I think obviously that's something that you can probably uh, start to think about a, a little bit further down the road. I, I think though, point being, and I think it was even brought up on, uh, I think it was Mike Florio Pro Football Talk, uh, if you are New Orleans and you get a chance to bid again, which is something they want to do, am I even going to waste my time with a, with a, putting a bid out with, with a, if I'm going against a new stadium? You right. mentioned Atlanta. Uh, you know, there, there's word out that that San Diego and Miami will eventually upgrade their stadium and do and do different you know things with their stadiums. Buffalo and at Buffalo. So, are you even going to waste your time with the bid if you know you're going up against a new stadium? I think that right now that's that's the the the, the situation they're in. I guess they'll be a little patient to see how it all kind of. Uh, plays out, but I, it's certainly something that's going to have to be revisited at some point. And we're on the clock too as well. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at when the lease ends mm -hmm. and, and when's the next opportunity for us to bid. And remember, there's also dates in there as well, conventions and Mardi Gras that we have to worry about when you start talking about the first week of February. Well, I mean, I think when you compare us to Minnesota, um, our reward for our public investment was 2013. Agreed. That's it. And, that's and it. there wasn't a long, a long passage of time. Minnesota hadn't had it since 1992. Mm -hmm. and sports landscape has changed a lot in the last 22 years. And, uh, you know, uh, but I think that the longer time between Super Bowls in New Orleans, the more sentiment will grow to come back here. And I think that the Superdome, as long as it's continually modernized, it. mm -hmm. you know, is, mm -hmm. is fine as long as it's not going up against a 
brand spanking new right. billion dollar stadium half funded by public money. Yeah, uh, <laughs> look, I, I agree with you. Let, let's talk a little bit, I want to get back to this, but let's talk a little bit about the presentation. Sean, you talked about the presentation being as strong as it's ever been. There have been some that have criticized the presentation only because the boxes were, were pretty much what we did the last time. Uh, instead of an iPod, it was an iPad. Um, uh, it was the same two that two gentlemen that that, that uh, mm -hmm. were involved in the presentation last time, Rod West and and of course Stephen Perry. Uh, could we have done more? Was, I don't it, know. Was it stale? I, was it something that we didn't look, we didn't I, wow them? Without us being able to actually see the actual video presentation, um, I, and I, I wasn't able to really see Minneapolis's presentation, but I just find it hard to believe that New Orleans didn't have more to offer than Minneapolis, just as far as culture, just as far as everything that New Orleans has in terms of a Super Bowl. I actually felt like it was very well done. We, we showed up at a breakfast the day of the meeting, uh, the day of the, the big vote, uh, and they had uh, they delivered pocket watches to each owner uh, in a box. It was in it had from 1718 to uh, 2018, obviously uh, commemorating the tricentennial. I thought it was a unique niche. And what else could they have really done considering they had the Super Bowl in 2013? Right. I mean, it was a short window of time. They had to mm -hmm. sell something. And I really felt like that was the thing to go with, the tricentennial celebration. Yes. Yeah, and I thought that was a strong thing to go with mm -hmm. because what they were basically telling the NFL is we're already doing all these infrastructure mm -hmm. upgrades and a global marketing campaign for 2018, mm -hmm. whether we have the Super Bowl or not. Mm -hmm. But if you want to piggyback on that and share in the global marketing that we're already doing, then you can do that. And you'd think that the NFL would be very interested in that. But um, it just... it. You know, the more I think about it, the more mm -hmm. I think about how hard it is to trump what Minnesota had yeah. to offer yeah. in that stadium. It, it, that was kind of the sentiment <laughs> with us after yeah. the It was kind of like, you know what? Maybe we were a little uh, naive here because yeah. it was it really confident. Yeah, a little over. Maybe we all we all kind of had that feeling of, wow, it really was a tough obstacle to overcome. And, and I know one fact that the owners, uh, which many thought was an advantage for New Orleans, was the fact that Mr. Benson is getting up there in age. I agree. And, this could be his and, last. And, this, and it could have been. So. Uh, it, it, all, all those factors certainly felt like the momentum was building for New Orleans, but you know, obviously, the NFL owners are very strong with this uh, uh, new stadium thing, and that's why Minneapolis has this uh, Super Bowl in 2018. 2018, positive or ne negative as we look back on it? Was it a positive to try to say to the NFL, which has its own brand, which again has its 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 own ability to be able to get the word out on what's going on with their particular brand, their Super Bowl, was it a positive or negative to uh, try to combine the two? Brett? Well, I think that it's hard to criticize it as a negative. It, the NFL, I don't think it was a negative, it just didn't have maybe as, as strong an impact or as much of a wow factor as the NFL as you would have hoped. More of a wow factor for us than exactly. for them. Maybe, yeah, but I mean common sense says, you know, you're just giving the NFL kind of like an additional mm -hmm. shot of free global publicity and why, why wouldn't they like that? Right. Yeah, I, I don't know what else they could have done. It being so close to the last time they hosted, uh, you gotta have a really rock solid reason uh, theme um, and you know, look, these bids are not, not easy to put together. I mean, you got to get all these restaurants together. Mm -hmm. They had a, a heads up; uh, they were going to build a facility near the Saints uh, complex. Right, right. It's a four field facility. Something like yeah. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Four field facility. Uh, you know, everything as far as financial incentives. It's not easy to put all this stuff together. So, I'm not sure what else they could have really sold that the NFL didn't already know. I mean, remember, this is ten times they've hosted, so the NFL is very familiar with the city of New Orleans. The city. Um, Fans, I believe, are now, you know, they're they're a little bit scared here now, mm -hmm. and and uh, I think that a lot of people felt there was an owner that, that the owners sent a message to the rest of of the NFL, especially those who are still hesitant about putting money into a new facility, that you know what, new facility trumps anything, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately that's when I think why the conversation is out there right now is. Okay, this building's 40 years old. Yes, it's been retrofitted. Yes, it's been modernized. But by the next time we have a chance, will it be that, that shining gem that we're seeing right now? And I think that, that, would you agree that the owners have sent the message that, hey, new stadium trumps everything? I, I, I think it's 100% clear based, based on this uh, alone. Just look at the track record of everyone that had their, you know, the first time they were eligible with a brand new stadium. Every one of them got it if you, if you go back. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the ultimate message here. And, and, you know, who knows what kind of precedent that sets. But uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that the owners, if you are able to get that sort of public input and public support for a stadium, you are going to get a Super Bowl. 
Brett, I mean, is it enough to be the perfect city to, to host a big event, or, or is it is a situation now where owners have sent that message? New stadium, well, yeah. and, and, you, and you get the game. Well, I think that new, not only new, new stadium, but new stadium plus a public-private partnership in building the stadium Great even, point. Tr even trumps that even more. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you look at Jer Jerry World, right, I mean, that mm -hmm. was pri private, and that yes. still got the Super Bowl. So, um, you know, it's uh, the, th the thing about it is that you know, these stadiums are built to last for a long time, and New Orleans just really just needs to pick a year. <laughs> right. Needs to be a finalist in a year when they're not going against something, you know, as imposing as this. Um, I know my, how, how much you guys follow what's going on in the state legislature right now, but, you know, this, this state is cash-strapped. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got some real problems with higher education, health care, trying to make ends meet at this point. We're borrowing money uh, to, to try to make uh, this budget, uh, uh, make it uh, uh, feasible. How, with the message that was sent by owners, can we not afford now to move forward with the improvements that we were talking about doing in our bid? Uh, these upgrades, these improvements, uh, whether they're going to be antiquated by in, in, in five, six years from now when we're making another bid or when we get another game, I would think that the message has been sent by the owners, continue to upgrade your facility. Uh, the game experience is a great experience. We love the dome. The reopening of the dome was a symbol of the rebirth of this city. But uh, now when you're looking at where we are, is there a situation now where we got those upgrades that we laid out that we need to do those now so that we can keep up with the Joneses? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what's going to get done anyway. You want to constantly update your facility. I'm not sure what, what facility in the NFL would ever do that. But I go back to what Brett said. I, I just think you got to look at your realistic chances and say, okay, do I put a bit here? Okay, is there a brand new stadium with this? I think that is the big thing. I think the Wolves can get into the Super Bowl fairly soon as long as it's not a brand new stadium they're up against because they will lose. If that. You can't tell me celebrating winter was a better presentation than uh, the tricentennial of New Orleans. I mean, who celebrates winter? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so that's Santa what, Claus. That, that's what beat well, New Orleans here. So just being, having grown up in Maine, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Quebec, Quebec, Quebec City, does Santa a Claus and Brett. Carnival. Yeah, <laughs> Quebec City does a winter carnival. It's pretty nice, you know. And people talked about the Lillehammer Olympics right. as being kind of like a winter winter mm -hmm. wonderland '94. There's, there is some merit to that. <laughs> Sorry, what, what are you, what are you, Sorry what, about that. No, 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 you were right. <laughs> you were right. Uh, Brett, what's your, what's your take? Should, uh, are we now in a position where we need to move forward with, um, look, with the new screens and everything that we talked about, don't leave them on the drawing board. Let's move forward with those things right now so that, that we are not in a situation where we fall behind. Um, I think that you shouldn't spend money frivolously, but at least some of those improvements on a, you know, maybe just not quite as, as in the same compressed mm -hmm. time frame, mm -hmm. but maybe spread them out a little more. But you need to be constantly showing the NFL that you that you got the message, and that and anyway, I mean, you want to improve the fan experience. The Saints want to do that, and they are important to the state. So why, you know, I don't see why not. Social media blew up. Everybody blaming the blackout. Uh, everything we've heard. I had Jay Cicero on the program. He said they didn't have anything to do with it. Everything we're hearing from the con from the from the uh, contingent that, that put this presentation up said blackout had nothing to do with it. Even though within their bid there was something in the bid to make sure they were going to change out uh, something to do with the electrical feeds. So this would never happen again. From what I understand, uh, the NFL is making that part of their specifications for new stadiums. So this will never happen again. Blackout played a no, part. No, um, really wasn't even brought up uh, after the the, the bid selection. Um, I, I, I don't buy that at all, and it, it's funny. I, I just that was one of those kind of lightning strike once in a it, it freak thing that had happened. It just so happened to be on the biggest stage, uh, obviously in the in, in the country. So no, I don't think the blackout had much to do with it at all. They addressed it pretty quickly, from what I was told inside the presentation. Uh, but I, I think for the most part, look, the NFL knows what it has in New Orleans for a Super Bowl. It's that simple. It was 100%. I talked to Jay Cicero right after it happened, three minutes after it mm -hmm. happened. It was 100% the new stadium. Right. Well, I would say um, I'd be inclined to largely agree that the blackout wasn't part of it. But it was still kind of an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it was an energy contractor that ultimately was at fault, but you know, energy had time to test it and retest yes. it, and it's, they're ultimately accountable for that, and people remember that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I mean, people haven't forgotten, and even if it was only like a very minor subconscious factor, it may be allowed in the minds, when you think about this, went to four votes. Yeah, four. There wasn't the super, so mm -hmm. it wasn't, see, New Orleans bid was that good, and people love New Orleans enough that actually there was enough people going against it wasn't a slam dunk for Minnesota, even right. with the stadium. 
But then when you try to think about the ways to rationalize in your mind and justify, you know, if you're on the fence, well, New Orleans had it just a couple years ago. Minnesota hasn't had it for 22 years. New Orleans had the blackout. Maybe that's, you know what I'm saying? Right. It, you, so it could have, it, it, just, it just didn't help. <laughs> right. Right. Well, well, fair. I'm sure yeah. that's fair enough to say it didn't yeah. help. It didn't help. But uh, again, over and over, we've been told that, that it's not even a factor. The commissioner said it's not even a factor. Uh, one thing that we know uh, going forward is it is going to be it, it is an arms race, OK, to mm -hmm. be able to compete and not just for Super Bowls, Final Fours, uh, championships in, in, in football and in major college football. Uh, the state of Texas and other states have, have, have developed a fund that is coming from taxpayer money. Uh, to be able to go after these major events. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the state is cash strapped. We don't have those type of dollars to be able to pour into a, a fund, that, a slush fund that can sit there so that we can go out and, and court these, uh, these organizations to bring these games back to New Orleans. Uh, should we have a fund like that? Can we afford a fund like that? Can we compete without a fund like that? But they've done so, right? I mean, uh, the, throughout the history of the city, I mean, especially over the last... But, to, but times are changing, Sean. They, they are. Uh, and look, without, and I'll be 100% honest with you, I, the legislature and, 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 and state budgets and stuff is probably not my, my area of expertise. Just tune in 11 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do quite <laughs> often. Uh, but, um, you know, I, if it's feasible and sure, but I, I just, I, I still think you can, you can get by without that. And, and they have such a good resume. New Orleans does for these events. I mean, look at the run they had no. uh, over the last year and a half. But, but a mean, lot of that was post Katrina. A lot of that was, and let's face it, we owe the NCAA, mm -hmm. we owe the N NBA, we owe the NFL a debt of gratitude for saying early in the process, we're going to bring our biggest events to this city to help them recover, mm -hmm. to help the city recover, and and they they fulfilled that promise. But they got what they needed too. I mean, the, the, the New Orleans did their end as well. Yes. So. I, it's a good partnership to me that that's what you can draw on and, and if, if, if that were the absolute necessity to get it I think you could probably make a pitch for that but right now as long as you're not getting shut out of everything I know the Super Bowl was a big hurt but I mean let's be honest we had it in 2013 mm -hmm. I would hold off on that right now yeah I think it depends on what you're bidding for I do think that it would have helped for the college national championship yes. that we lost mm -hmm. I think it might have helped that the Glendale got right the Glendale mm -hmm. got yeah and and so I don't think it's as imperative for a Super Bowl but, um, you know, and I'm not really sure what the answer is to doing it. You got to look, you can't look at it as an expenditure. You have to look at it as an investment and what's mm -hmm. the return on the investment in terms of justifying some public money going to something like that. And maybe there's a public private partnership to be done. You know, I mean, politicians are good at raising money, right? Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, yes. you know, maybe we need to go, money too. maybe we need <laughs> to go to, you know, I don't know, Davison Trucking mm -hmm. and Edison Schwest Offshore and mm -hmm. Chevron and Shell yeah. and say, can you help us right. generate money for this public private, pro you know, partnership that's going to, be a benefit of the state. You know, you, you talk about return on investment. There was a, a UNO study recently that uh, said that the, when you look at the at the uh, Louis, at the now Mercedes-Benz Superdome and the economic impact, you look at the renovations that have been done from 2006 to now. You look at what's projected uh, in terms of revenue, what it will produce for the city of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana between 2006 and when the Saints lease runs out in 2025. They estimate a $19.9 billion return for the state of Louisiana and the city of New Orleans. So it is wise to invest in, 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 the, uh, in the Superdome, in the New Orleans arena. Because we are a tourist-based town, we're getting that money back. But the question is, can we put, afford to put the money up front to be able to get that, that investment back? But that was a, a recent UNO study, and I think that's pretty eye-opening. I, I, I think it goes to show that you're right. It, it, you do get that money back, and it is a good investment. Um, can you afford it on the front end? That, that, that's obviously the key question, and it's probably a little above my pay grade, but I, look, I, I think, and I'm a sports guy, these type of investments are indeed worth it. It's just a matter of can you afford it when the right. time comes. Just don't, just don't give away the farm, but you got, if at least you, if you have something to offer you know, that gets you in the ballpark of the people who may be beating you in this area, but you have something to get in the ballpark, and then you combine that with New Orleans charm mm -hmm. and the logistical advantages that the city's layout provides, then you know, those sure. three things puts New Orleans in front. Final question on this before we go to our break. Sean, does the, does the Mercedes-Benz Superdome see another Super Bowl uh, before the end of the Saints lease in 2025? I think it's got a shot, say, the 2022-2023 time. I think it, the, this run on new stadiums is going to go for the next couple of years. Um, but I could see it happening again if there's one of those years where just kind of a new stadium may be on the way but not quite ready. They may have that good look. Because I, I truly believe the NFL, there's there's the, the San Diego, Phoenix, 
New Orleans and Miami rotation. They want to still keep that in the because they know what they have there. Right. So I think there is still a chance New Orleans can host again. Yeah, I believe so too. And and a stadium has to be open for two years before it can host. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these stadiums are still in the planning or idea stages. So especially right. like San Diego, I don't know how far they've gotten with there. You know, so any concern about uh, again if there's a possible and look, we don't know. It could be tomorrow. They could be discussing an, uh, to an extension of the lease mm -hmm. past 2025. We certainly hope so. I mean, we hope that all that lease talk and everything that was going on before mm -hmm. Katrina is gone and out the window now. Uh, but uh, can this happen with only maybe a couple years left on that lease? Or do you think that lease? what the Saints needs to be extended for us to be able to get that Super Bowl? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I certainly wouldn't hurt to have the lease extended, um, but I don't think it's impossible. I mean, I don't. I, I think they could get it without, without having that lease extended, depending on what, what year it was, say right. 2022, mm -hmm. to still have three years left right, on the lease. Yeah, I, would, I would think so. Yeah. I, I agree with Sean. You don't have to have that done, but if you want to be proactive and have a really strong mm -hmm. bid, right. then maybe you ought to have a lease extension with upgrades built in and show that to the NFL, too. Which, again, looks for a reward for, right. for extending that lease, right. as we've seen in the past. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. We've got a great panel for you tonight. Brett Martell of the Associated Press, Sean Vazan of Fox 8 Sports, 866-3200 is the phone number if you'd like to chime in. You'd like to talk about the, uh, the failed Super Bowl bid, uh, what's in, in the future for the Dome, the Saints. Or, again, as we switch gears, as we come back from our commercial break, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Saints draft. We'll talk about the New Orleans Pelicans, Eric Gordon. All that coming up next here on Inside New Orleans Sports. <laughs> Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by the Union Capital Corporation, Natel's Air Conditioning and Heating, a proud sponsor of the St. Jude Dream Home, and Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House. My life is full of statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself, but I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is literally saving kids' lives. It's a very special place, friendly place. And to see the kids that they're helping on a daily basis was unbelievable. Families never receive a bill from St. Jude. Discoveries made at St. Jude are freely shared. The hardest cancer cases in the world go to St. Jude. We won't stop until no child dies from cancer. Join us. Join us. In supporting hoops for St. Jude. Visit stjude.org slash hoops to find out how. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. On our panel tonight, Sean Bazan of Fox 8 Sports, Brett Martell of the Associated Press. Remember, each and every Thursday night, 6 p.m., right here on WLAE-TV with our live broadcast. We have a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night here on WLAE at 10 o'clock and also on Pelican Sports Television in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. So if you can't catch us live, why don't you make sure you set that DVR each and every Thursday night so you can catch our great panel here on Inside New Orleans Sports. Guys, let's shift gears from the heartache of losing a Super Bowl to, uh, again, the possibility of being in the Super Bowl mm -hmm. this year. And it starts, obviously, with the lifeblood of any franchise, which is the draft. Mm -hmm. And Sean, I'll start with, I'll start with you. Um, I want to tell you, first of all, you did a fantastic job leading up to the draft. Uh, your mock drafts, keeping us informed through your blog on what was going on. Uh, tell us about your thoughts on the draft as a whole. You know, um I thought the first round pick was a home run. I just, I really think Brandon Cooks is going to really excel immediately for this offense. Um, and Stanley Jean Baptiste was a guy. I, the size that he had pre-draft, I thought that was someone they could target. They got him. I think he can eventually be a guy that can be your starter along the outside. Um, Back into the draft, I can understand why there's a little bit of skepticism. I think Vinny Sinceri sticks around because I think he's got he's one of those special teams warrior types who I think can be a, he's a better player than Steve Leeson and Chris Reese was, but I think he's got that type of impact as far as just uh, a heart guy, a, a fan favorite, and I think he can be a contributor on defense at some point. Um, didn't quite get the Tavon Rooks pick. I, I, if you ask me, I, I don't think he makes the team. Other two guys are intriguing because they, they had kind of an incomplete in, in their collegiate career, so obviously they saw something. Uh, so I, I think overall, if you get three players to really stick with this team long term, I think it's a decent draft. So I, I, I was fine with the, with the Saints draft. Brett? Yeah, I like the way they tried to address 
Um, and it was so much different from 2007 with Robert Meacham mm -hmm. too, I think, mm -hmm. which was kind of just like, that's a big receiver with a lot of potential and mm -hmm. he ended up seeming like a bust for the first couple of years. Um, this was a guy that um, had been really durable, really productive. They, they did their homework on his character and his versatility and his speed and it, he just has so much that seems to be going for him. And even when we interview him too, mm -hmm. he, he seems ready he just seems mentally straight confidence. ready, uh, yeah, to, to to step in and try to use his versatility to fill a lot of the holes that were created with the loss of of guys like uh, Darren Sproles and a little bit with Lance Moore. Yes. And, and uh, so that's a good pick. Now, Jean, ba I'm going to insist on saying Jean, Jean Baptiste. Well, it, it's, I mean, a, it's a done deal. <laughs> yeah, here. I, know. I okay. mean, he's going to have to learn he's gonna have that, to get over that it. he lives in Louisiana, <laughs> yes. and it sounds. I think the girls will like that better yeah. anyway because yeah. it sounds more sophisticated. So he'll 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 buy in uh, after we talk to him about it a little bit, but um, he now he for him to be effective, I think uh, most effective, you also have to have a very good pass rush because the uh, the idea is that he's a big guy, mm -hmm. he can jam at the line of scrimmage, you know, play the press coverage. But sure. if the pa if the quarterback's not under pressure, then fast receivers are going to get away from him eventually. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so but that's why you've upgraded your safety position. Yeah, I mean, Jarris so. Bird over the top helps a lot. I, I, you know, I would agree with you, Brett. I, I like the pick, and, but I've said it before. You know, I think that Cooks is going to be a guy that makes an immediate impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that if you find, and I said this on last week's show, and, and, and uh, I've said it on my radio show before, before as well, if Jean-Baptiste is playing more than 30% of the snaps uh, with the regular defense, you know, then you got a problem. That means that more than likely you've got some injuries, maybe to Champ Bailey, maybe some, maybe a guy like Corey White has not progressed the way you need him to progress. You, w what you want to do is you want to have him in sub packages and you want to make sure that he's playing special teams. I think the same thing can be said uh, for fourth, Sinceri, and, and also Ronald Powell. Powell probably a guy, a situational pass rusher. Uh, Fort will probably play some in the passing game in situations. And Sinceri, a guy that more, more than likely is a special teams guy. But I think all these guys, when you look at from Jean Baptiste all the way to Powell, I think these guys are special teams guys that, that have a role maybe one or two years from now when uh, when contracts start to start to uh, inflate and guys start to get a little older. Brett? Yeah, you know, it's I think Sinceri, um, I agree with you. You know, it's funny. I, I think about Craig Steltz. Mm -hmm. He's still in the NFL. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been primarily a special teams guy and a reserve safety and stuff like that. But he always showed really good football instincts. I remember when he played for LSU, the clutch plays that he would make, the interceptions in the end zone, stuff like that. And and I see Sinceri as in a similar mold. Um, and he was a coach's son, and I think the players like, you know, the way that his football instincts and smarts are going to make up for whatever physical limitations he might have to some mm -hmm. extent. Yes. Um, yeah. And then you you got guys like Powell and Fort that have, seem to have tremendous physical tools and and did have injuries, and uh, they have a lot of upside. Yeah, I so. would agree with that. Sean, you, as, as you've kind of looked at them, yeah, and, and, and what, you know, what's your I, thoughts? I think what role will they play? to me. Is is a guy you mentioned Stelts? It's a pretty good comparison, but I, I think this is a guy that had ten interceptions in basically a year and a half of starting at Alabama. I know he played, started a little bit earlier in his career, but he was the main starter. I believe it was would have been his redshirt sophomore mm -hmm. year, and he got hurt last year, half midway through the season. He made plays. Ten picks is not is, is, that's that's not. So he knows how to play, and he and that was one that was the premier defense in college football. So I think he's he's a football player, and I think he can be a special teams guy, and I think we're selling him a little bit short, but he could possibly be a contributor uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Jean-Baptiste, to me, that's the one to watch this year because I think they have such a high uh, uh, vision for him. They want him to be the shutdown corner opposite of Keenan sure. Lewis. The learning curve, does he? Is his learning curve, is, you mentioned if he's playing more than 30% of the snaps, it's a bad thing. Not necessarily if he picks it up fast Agreed. and all of a sudden they see that growth sure. in him. So, the learning curve with Jean-Baptiste to me is the biggest intrigue of this draft right away, the rookie year. Yeah, but again, the, the Saints' vision would like they'd like to see, obviously Champ Bailey is that mm -hmm. starter. Mm -hmm. uh, I can definitely see um, Jean-Baptiste in, in sub-packages, you know, using his um, ability to jam at the, at the line of scrimmage. Uh, ultimately, again, that's why they've, they've invested so heavily in their safeties as well. Uh, but I think he's a good pick. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it's a, I think down the line he, it, will, it will prove out that he was worth the second round pick. And we, we've had, you know, there's been some shaky drafts. Mm -hmm. You know, people have gone over it. But, you know, this is not going to be one of those instant impact drafts. In my opinion, this is one of those drafts you look back in three years and you say, okay, how many of these guys mm -hmm. are making an impact? Uh, would you guys agree? Well, yeah, and I would, I would also agree um, with what Sean said about Sinceri. Uh, you know, Saban did trust him to make defensive calls and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, uh, he he could he could be he could have more upside than we than a lot of people think he has. 
Brett, were you as surprised as I was that they didn't spend more attention and uh, maybe uh, look at the interior of the offensive line more? Well, yes, um, I was. Um, but they must have just, uh, the way Sean explained it made sense to me. Um, they must have felt like it just wasn't a deep draft at that position and the guys who were available when they were picking it was kind of like a product of timing. Mm -hmm. They just, the, the centers who were available when they were picking just weren't really that close to the best players on their board who were yeah. still available and they just decided they're going to have to go another route and they have a philosophy and they, that's been successful so they stuck to it. I, I think that's what it boiled down to. They stuck to their philosophy yes. and they always talk about the cloud. Sure. You know, there's a cloud of three or four players. Mm -hmm. You never just have the, the you, you don't just take the top guy. No it's, it's generally about three or four guys mm -hmm. when you pick us up. And if, th if that center didn't fall on those three or four guys, then they, 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 they stayed away. Uh, I was a little surprised it wasn't addressed, but they trust their scouts, they trust their philosophy, and given their track record and their past success, I think we should trust them and maybe give them the benefit of the doubt in that regard, because they seem to have a lot of faith in Lolito, and who knows what will happen with Goodwin at some right. point. But Look, they've, they've rolled the dice on a rookie before. Brian De La Puente, no one even heard of him before True. he got here. So, and he, he started midway through the mm -hmm. season. It wasn't like he had a training camp to really go with. But So, I think ultimately uh, that'll work itself out. But I'm curious to see ultimately who that position goes to because Lolito has never played center in the NFL. Right. But he did, I guess he did pr get a lot of reps at practice at mm -hmm. center last year. And Mickey did say something interesting, um, which was that he believes a, a rookie or a relatively inexperienced center has a better chance to succeed in New Orleans because of having an all-pro and a pro bowler on e either mm -hmm. side of them, right. and because Drew Brees, and, and Zach Streif agreed with this too when we talked to him at the um, charity golf tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, Drew tends to make most of the line calls more so than, so that, so that the center for the Saints doesn't have to do as much as centers on some other teams. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's set up for them to just get a guy with a good skill set. And I, I would also say this Armstrong kid, the, you know, he was mm -hmm. the Division II center of the year and um, there's, there's another div former Division II player on the Saints offensive line right now who's been a multiple time All Pro and started in his rookie season. What's that guy's <laughs> name? That guy's <laughs> name, Jerry Evans. Jerry yeah. Evans. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they do, they do very well at scouting these no, small schools do. for offensive linemen. They, maybe, you know, maybe he'll surprise us. Well, we do have two center, I mean, two guards that are getting up in age. We've got two guards that, that, that are getting a large chunk of, of the uh, salary cap, and, uh, you know, those salaries continue to balloon. Uh, that's the thing that shocked me about not maybe going out and maybe not addressing the center position, so to speak, but to maybe bring in another guard. It'll be interesting to see what, what they think they have in guys that are already on this team or guys that they've looked at in the undrafted free agency who they can believe they, they can come in. I think everybody kind of agrees that maybe Jonathan Goodwin may be a guy that will at least be brought in to compete at this point. I'd be shocked if he wasn't, but I'm also kind of shocked that it hasn't happened yet. Um, it, it would seem like now would be the time. I mean, he's, he, I don't know that there's any, that there's no need to get to, there's no getting to know process. They already had the visit. So uh, the longer it goes, the, the, the less and less confident I am that it's going to happen. So we'll see with Jonathan Goodwin. I've been kind of waiting for it. I've been uh, waiting for it for a couple weeks now, and it just hasn't happened. I think the Saints are close enough against the cap that they would just, there's a couple of things still still in the air with the Jimmy Graham contract, mm -hmm. and then maybe Jonathan's also thinking that maybe some other team at some point will be willing to offer him more than the veteran mm -hmm. minimum, where I think the Saints are kind of just saying, right. well, you come play for the veteran minimum. Um, so there's, there's reasons, I think, for both sides to wait a little longer. Mm -hmm. Can you so, afford going into the season without a veteran center? Uh, to have in case of emergency, in case things don't work out with Alita? I guess that's, we'll see. Um, like I said, they, they did it before with De La Puente when, when, when Cruz retired, and all of a sudden he was thrust in there and he started for, for three years. Uh, you would obviously prefer to not to, to have a veteran there, but uh, look, right now Lolito is really the only well, option at this and, point. And, and let's face it, guys, he's going to get an opportunity now through mm -hmm. OTAs, uh, he's going to get every opportunity to be the guy, and they'll be able to monitor his progress and have a pretty good feel on what they think will happen when the real bullets are flying. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, and also I've seen the Saints make fairly good adjustments, whether it's because of um, unforeseen injuries during training camp and preseason to bring guys in or make, you know, trades. So I would say they can afford to go into training camp without that guy. but. You know, you better have it figured out by the third or fourth preseason game. You right. know, if you're going to need, you're going to have to make a move quick or, or not. So, any undrafted free agents catch your eye? 
couple that, that maybe uh, have, may have a chance of making this yeah, team? Yeah, you know, obviously the one everyone's kind of talking about, he was a guy I actually had them taking in the mo in my mock in the uh, one in one in the fifth round, one in the fourth round was Brandon Coleman, wide receiver out of Rutgers, six foot six. Uh, 215 pounds. We only got to see about, Brett, I'm not sure if you were there. We only got to see about a half hour mm -hmm. of the rookie minicamp. And uh, Peyton was, the little bit we saw, Peyton was really concentrating on him, giving him pointers, giving him tips. So it seems to me like they they liked him from the start. And they I know they brought him in for a pre-draft visit. I'm convinced that had they not drafted Brandon Cooks early, mm -hmm. he may have been the guy, say, fourth round and they were kind of fortunate to have him slip all the way down to the undrafted mm -hmm. ranks because I don't think Peyton even kind of mentioned it would have been tough for us to draft two wide receivers in this class yeah, so uh, I think ultimately he's the guy to watch like Tim Flanders out of Sam Houston mm -hmm. State as well and Derek Strozier uh, mm -hmm. out of uh, Tulane right we walked out there, Brett. I, I don't know if you saw, thought this as well. He had 43. He's about five foot eight. Oh, yeah. We thought it was Sproles for a second. <laughs> yeah. He looked just like him because yeah. he was a DB at Tulane. Well, uh, but, but he was, played his first running, couple seasons at running back. As a running back, and, and he chose to play running right. back. Well, he signed as a running right. back for the Saints. And he has that skill set. He really does. He has that Sproles skill set. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. He 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 was such a good athlete, and the, and Tulane had a had kind of a glut at running back, mm -hmm. and they really needed some playmakers in the defensive backfield. And uh, they put him back there. And this past season, he had two long touchdowns, one on a blocked mm -hmm. uh, field goal and one on like a 99-yard interception mm -hmm. return. Um, and when he, th yeah, the very first thing when I saw him <laughs> is I said, I just turned to someone and said, I thought they traded Sproles. Yeah. <laughs> because it just, just looked, like him, right? it looked just, just like, like him. Right. <laughs> Hopefully he can perform just like yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. Um, guys, how, they, there was a lot of talk that Aaron Murray was on the board and, and, and maybe this team was looking at, at a possibility of drafting him. How close do you think that got? Oh, uh, I now think you had, I, you had, I, I had Murray him, you know, look, in the fourth I, round listen, of your mock listen, draft. I'll admit that was a little bold on my part, right? but you know it was my my mock draft, so I went ahead and, and went right? with it. Fourth round was not in hindsight. Fourth round was definitely too high, but I really believe sixth round pick. You're starting to think about that because mm -hmm. you're talking about Mettenberger, Murray, mm -hmm. and McCarron that were really lingering in that late fifth round or early sixth round. So, and I really just got the sense that Murray was the guy they wanted. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you felt that way as well, but. Sixth round to me, if they'd have still been there, would have been the time. If they'd have lingered into the sixth round, maybe they'd mm -hmm. trade up to possibly get uh, an Aaron Murray. But I think sixth round would have been the round. If they'd have been available, one of those guys could have been a saint. Brad, what's your, th what's your thoughts on that? Well, it's there's still a bit of a risk to taking a high-profile college quarterback when Drew Brees has three years left in his current mm -hmm. deal and is coming off three consecutive seasons where he threw for more than 5,000 yards yes. and no less than 39 touchdowns in any of those seasons. Right. <laughs> well, because the clock starts. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the biggest problem. That's you got it. four years to hold on to this mm -hmm. player. And we're, we, we've seen it in, in New England uh, several times where you can't hold on. you got a guy on a bench. He's a quality player. Maybe he comes in, in, in the case of, uh, of Tom Brady, for injury. All of a sudden he shows his wear, and now he becomes an asset, a movable asset. But at the same time, if you're grooming this guy, you're, I've always said I think next year yeah. is, is probably the time you really start looking. But I can understand what the Saints brass well, were thinking. It, These guys fell, and, and you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute. I didn't even think this guy was going to be here in that round. That, that's the thing. And we go back to the philosophy mm -hmm. we talked about. Highest grade. I can recall, uh, I believe it was Pioli uh, for New England. He said mm -hmm. they didn't want to draft Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. He was so high on their boy when they were available mm -hmm. in the, well, I guess it was the sixth round. Yes. They had to take him. I think that was, that was this situation. It was kind of a lightning in a bottle. Whoa, he's available? I mean, even if even if it's worth the risk at a sixth round pick. Right. I mean, it really. Let's 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 be real. Sixth round draft choice. Right. So I mm -hmm. think ultimately, the guy was the, the one of those players were rated pretty high on their board, and it wasn't a sixth round grade. So if they would have got to them in the sixth round, I think they would have taken it. Anything you can add? Yeah. I'm, well, I mean, I could I could easily see taking a. Aaron Murray over Tavon Rooks at that point. Yeah, you know, but there you go. maybe Rooks will turn out yeah, to be a really good we'll lineman. We'll you know, obviously they <laughs> saw something in Rooks, yeah. and and you know maybe he's a guy that's going to red shirt. Maybe he's going to be on practice squad, put some weight on him, and you know remember that's how Zach Streif was. Zach Streif was kind of in the wings. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens on that. The Jimmy Graham grievance hearing is June 17th through the 18th. Do you think it'll ever get to the grievance hearing? Uh, well, it's a risk for the Saints, I think, unless they've just. You know, we're not talking about we're not talking about a a, a jury where you know that have been known to no. like shock you know college company. professor. I mean, <laughs> yeah, is that, is we're that, talking about an arbitrator, and right. I think that the Saints feel like you know they have a team of lawyers mm -hmm. who are who are you know looking into this, and if they feel like they have a really strong case, they may let it go that mm -hmm. far. They may think that the risk is not that great that they'll lose, mm -hmm. and that it's worth 
letting it go that far. But you know, if if their feedback tells them, well, it's a new CBA and this is an untest, this is like a precedent-setting moment, and we could lose, they can't afford to lose they, in arbitration. They, so it probably will be signed before right. June 17th. There is no way Jimmy Graham will be paid as a wide receiver franchise tag in 2014. They cannot afford it. That is a $12 million all against the cap. Yes. There is no promoted. way. Exactly. Right. There yeah. is. Well, who are you going to cut? Who are you going to cut? you got to right. cut some players, right? right. You're going to be over the cap at that sure. point. There is absolutely no way. If it gets to that point, they will work out a long-term deal, cap-friendly in the right. first year. There is absolutely no way Jimmy Graham plays, with a wide, plays under the franchise tag as a wide receiver. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. If So if Jimmy Graham wins, the Saints still have until July. I forget the date. It's mid-July, like the 15th mm -hmm. or something, something like to that. To work out a long-term sure. deal, which mitigates the, the effect of losing in arbitration right. and gets you back under the cap. But um, but they, the th the problem is that Graham then just has a lot more leverage oh, if he yeah, wins. Absolutely. So it, it's a, it's a complicated calculation for the Saints to make at this point, um, and it's. But really I don't hard. believe for, Graham wants to play under the franchise tag, even if it is well, for twelve million. It's no, a one-year deal. No, he, he wants a long-term deal. Long -term he long -term deal. Right. So I think yeah. it's the best for all parties right. here to get this deal done. Well, that is the ultimate solution here. And guys, I don't think the NFL wants to see this through <laughs> arbitration. You know, oh, I, I no. think when you're looking at thirty-one other owners, they're, they're they're saying, wait a minute, we'd rather not test this yeah. water if we don't have to. And depending on how close, they can't be that far away. I mean, you know pretty much what he's going to be making a year. The, the, what it comes down to is guaranteed money. How much is the guarantee? money and how it's ultimately going to be structured and let's face it Loomis is one of the best in the business I mean he is uh, you know you're not going to you're not going to put one past him on this he's probably got his ducks in a row already on this situation I don't think the grievance hearing happens I think that they get a deal done at the 11th hour and and, and this is going to be tested by some other team some other player yeah, and it could be a different position, like a defensive end, yes. outside linebacker. Which is the same type of situation <laughs> right. we're seeing yeah. right now. Those are the tight end, outside linebacker, defensive end, tight end, wide receiver are, are the ones that really you got to kind of find a new designation for them. It, it, you know, I think we talked about this months ago when we I was did. on your show. It almost feels like wasted energy. The numbers are there. Yeah. The numbers are there to make the deal. Then it went stone silent for a while. This was the hottest topic in the NFL for yes. a while. Then it went eerily silent, and now it's starting to slowly starting to creep back up again. The numbers are there. I mean, it, you, I mean, I, this is not rocket science to me. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it, it went all the way down this route because uh, I just don't think either side wants to play under the franchise tag. They want a long-term deal. It's m mutually beneficial. Let's shift gears and talk a little Pelicans. Uh, Pelicans right now, about $7.5 million under the cap. Uh, they don't have a tremendous amount of wiggle room. John Reed, in a recent article in the New Orleans Times-Picayune, spoke to Eric Gordon uh, about the possibility of him becoming the sixth man for this team. And uh, uh, again, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the exact quote, but uh, his thoughts were that uh, he was brought in to lead and set the tone for the team. Uh, I've talked about it on the radio show, really haven't really discussed it at, at length on this program. Yeah, he was brought in to lead. He was brought in to set the tone, but he's done neither. And there's a, there's a new sheriff in town. His name is Anthony Davis. This is now Anthony Davis' team. Tyreek Evans is a guy that started his entire NBA career until he got to New Orleans. You never heard a peep out of Tyreek about having to come off the bench. Would he have rather been a starter? Absolutely would have rather been a starter. But now you've got a guy that's, that has $15 million uh, against the cap this year, $15 million in a player option the following year. And it looks like, at least right now, that he's not interested in, in, in being a team player and maybe coming off the bench. Brett, I'll take you first. What do you think happens with Eric Gordon? Well, he's still going to be difficult uh, to move. And, um, you know, he's going to have to do what the coaches tell him. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is that when Tyree got his chance to start, he was a lot more productive. And he was also showing tremendous chemistry with Anthony Davis. Those two guys fit for whatever reason, fit really did. well together yeah. on the floor at the mm -hmm. same time. And you can't, you know, you just can't. Eric is kind of his own player, you know? Right. <laughs> I mean, he's a really talented guy, mm -hmm. but he doesn't necessarily have the same level of chemistry with AD that Tyreek does. And you just, if you're trying to win games, you need to have guys on the floor at the same time that give you the maximum productivity, that make each other better and so forth. Right. So, uh, you know, I think that Eric, inc we're going to increasingly see but it's going to be a little bit based on the lim financial limitations that the con you know the contract provides of, of moving Eric out. Yes. <laughs> Not only should he come off the bench. Uh, first of all, I, th I think he's here to start next season. Let's just mm -hmm. put that out there. Um, 
not only should he come off the bench, I think he needs to look at it and say, this may be an opportunity. For, I think he's he flourishes off the bench because he's a he's a streaky scorer and he's not a guy that can carry a team. And you saw the chemistry issues when they had Tyreek and him on the floor at the same yes. time. It, it just there was a lot of duplication. I think him coming in and his ability to score is exactly what you would need off the bench. He's not a guy that's going to carry the team. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have great chemistry with Anthony Davis. Not only should he not come off, not only should he not start. I think coming off the bench helps him probably allows him to become more productive. Yeah. Look, Sean Kelly on this show a few weeks back said that automatically he would be interested in seeing how Eric Gordon performs against a team's second line guards. Mm -hmm. Automatically he's going to be better than mm -hmm. those guys coming off the bench. So that will help him and help his game. Look, there are just a few options out there for this and, and, and I'm going to lay them out for you simply. A, he renounces his last year of his deal so that he can become a free agent at the end of the season. If he does that, the Pelicans now can move him. Mm -hmm. he, is a, he is an easier player to move if he wants to be traded. Uh, he can renounce that last year, become the sixth man on this team, and become a free agent at the end of the season. Or, again, renounce the last year and let the Pelicans buy him out and then allow him to go to another franchise. The Pelicans have the ability to take that contract, stretch it over three years, uh, $5 million a year, and then whatever he signs with with another, with another club, that money comes off the, off the Pelicans' books against his contract. So the ball is in his court. The biggest obstacle to moving Eric Gordon is the, is the $15 million option year that, that comes next year. And if he's willing to give that up right now and roll the dice, the Pelicans can accommodate him if he'd like to be moved. Would you give up fifteen million? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. But you know, there have been people that have said yeah. out there that that in turn, in, in, he would give up the fifteen million for another four years, right. and, and and to have some stability there, and maybe four years at you know twenty five million, you know overall, well, where he's picking up where he's picking up maybe ten million. I think the Pelicans have have, have moved on from him. Uh, they know he's not the, the guy to build around. So if he sticks around and 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 and, op, and, and stays. Well, they're gonna, he's going to have to stay under their terms. It's going to be, you're the sixth man. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So, look, it's a tough situation as far as how much money he is making, how much he counts. But I think ultimately uh, the Pelicans have their plan if he's there. And if he's not there, they'll move on without him. So right. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see him as a big hindrance right, right. now. Well, as long as he's not going to be a problem in the locker exactly. room. That's, that, that's, that's, gonna be, that's the biggest issue going forward. To the phone lines we go. To Bradley in New Orleans. Bradley, welcome. You're on Inside New Orleans Sports. Hello, Eric. Bradley. Sean, Brett, how are y'all doing? Great. This, this voice sounds familiar. <laughs> it probably is familiar. Um, I have a question for y'all about Jimmy Graham. The, the thing that nobody talks about is what if it's that they know the numbers are there and they want to agree, but they're just both sides are just hard headed and, and stuck in the sand and don't care to, you know, don't want to be the ones to give in? Bradley, thank you for the phone call. Good to hear your voice again. <laughs> Brett? Yeah, he probably knows more about sports in this market than anybody yeah. else at LSU <laughs> should, should, should uh, we physical tell, therapy school. Should we tell him who that was? <laughs> but anyway, we, we, uh, miss, we miss him very much. Bradley yeah, Edward. Yeah. Former member of the, uh, media, of the New Orleans media. media. Yes. yes, good guy. Um, well, uh, yeah, and, and the question was about both sides being hard-headed. Yes. I, um, I mean, that's possible. I think really it's just more being deliberate because um, they, they do have a little more time to work it out, and I just think that they... Uh, you know they're trying to count. You know they're tr they're trying to work out a very complicated deal that's going to max you know maximize value well, for both sides. I, I think it's a valid point Bradley brought up no, because I, I, I've already said it. I feel like this is a little bit of wasted energy. I just don't understand why they they feel the need to drag this out uh, when you know what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. As Bradley said, I, I, there there could be a little bit of validity to that. Right. I, I just I, I think this deal should have been done a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, but you know I don't think they I don't think it's for the Saints they don't want to get to to this grievance hearing. You know, why are you going to let an arbitrator ultimately dictate what you're going to pay a player when, again, at least the statistics bear out that he played, uh, he didn't play the tight end position mm -hmm. as much as he played the wide receiver position. Now, that position is different in the Saints offense as it's evolving in everyone else's offense. But I sure don't want a college professor telling me what I got to pay my what I got to pay my, my players. I'd rather go ahead. The negotiations are in my hands. Let, let's move forward on it. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Yeah. James is in Franklinton. James, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey there, Eric. How, how y'all doing? James. Um, and I say hi to the panel, too. Um, my question is this. Why shouldn't Dell Demps, the GM, uh, before the, the, the uh, new ownership came in with Benson, why shouldn't he be fired 
for a lot of the moves he made, including hiring uh, uh, the, the coach that they have now, Monty Williams. Uh, it doesn't make any sense because if you ask me, one, we don't have a marquee coach. We, to me, we have a lot of talent on the team. We don't have a marquee coach, and we have made a lot of stupid moves, which you guys just talked about. Hey, could y'all expound on that for me, please? Thanks. Hey, thank I'll you, hang James. up and listen. Uh, that's, a t that's a tough call. Uh, some have said that, especially with the draft not, not having a pick in this draft, that, that, that uh, Dell Demps is on the clock. I've always felt that Demps and, and Williams should get at least one more season. It's been a turbulent time with this franchise that they've had to go through. Has all of his deals worked out? No. But I think you have to give him at least one more season. Brett? Well, the thing that with both of these guys is that they're both, they're both relatively young and relatively inexperienced. And, and you, you like to think, especially the American way, is that they're learning yes. um, from their mistakes. And, you know, wouldn't it be something if these guys learn from all their mistakes in New Orleans and they're still very young and then go somewhere else and become very successful? Sure. I mean, and, and when you consider how young they are and give them the benefit of the doubt that they're learning and consider, like you said, the turbulent times that they've been surrounded by with the change in ownership and all the instability, that's why maybe you have just a little more patience with them than you'd normally have. But clearly they made some, they clearly have made some mistakes. Yes. You just you just gotta hope that you see very soon that they have learned from those mistakes and they've figured it out. Well right. first off, this is it. There's yeah. no more this is it. It doesn't matter how many injuries you have, this right. is it. This year, this is it. This is all you get. But why they weren't fired, I think when the, at the time of the ownership change, Monty and Dell, correct me if I'm wrong, was still viewed as rising stars. No, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. you know, that first year was, was, was they got themselves to the playoffs. They, you know, they were able to get something out of the Chris yes. Paul deal. Obviously, it ended up being a, an Eric Gordon who was, you know, who's had his issues. Um, but they have made mistakes, and they are, as you said, evolving, learning, as we all are in any line of work. Um, they've been patient, but I think this is it. You've got to make a move now to get it into the playoffs right. this year. No, look, I agree, but I also say that you got to throw last year out. There is not a coach in the league that could lose the type of talent that Monty Williams lost and, and ultimately win. There, whether you're a general manager and you're trying to put these pieces together, if you don't have a, have a uh, at least a body of work to be able to judge those pieces, how are you going to how are you going to fire someone? You got to give them at least this season and let's see what happens. Yeah, I agree. You got you got to try to get a sense of whether of how he, how he's going to do when you have everybody healthy and everyone's supposed to be healthy next year and you just. I mean, I can't, the law of averages have to work out that you're yes. not going to have as many right. injuries. I mean, that was kind of ridiculous last And season. they were only a couple pieces away. I mean, they, they, you know, they, yeah. they're, they're not that, that far away. Uh, again, some of these pieces don't fit right now. You get, and, and I would be interested to see if they're going to be active in the offseason, maybe trying to tweak this team some. But I think, one more, guys, yeah. one more season. Let's also, just see what they've uh, got. Yeah, Williams was renowned, I've said him before on this show, for working with young big men. And yes. when you look at Anthony Davis's jump from year one to year two, you've got to give Monty some credit. He's a great player developer. I think his game day management, you can call him the question sometimes, but right. I think this is it I last season. <laughs> Sean Bazana, Fox 8 Sports, Brett Marcelli, Associated Press. Thanks so much for being on our panel tonight. Mm -hmm. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, to Inside New Orleans Sports. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this show each and every Friday night at 10 o'clock here on WLAE-TV and Pelican Sports Television in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. You can also catch me on the radio weekdays, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. on 990 a.m. WGSO. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric underscore Asher. Remember, if you missed any of the previous episodes of Inside New Orleans Sports, you can catch those at ericasher.com. Also, you can catch the podcast or listen live to my radio show at ericasher.com as well. Special thanks to the WLAE production staff including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Donovan Joseph, Kenny Juno, my producer, director, William Hill. Uh, for Sean Vazan, for Brett Martell, my name is Eric Asher. Thanks so much for tuning in to Inside New Orleans Sports. We'll see you right back here next Thursday, 6 o'clock. Good evening. Eric Asher is underwritten by the Union Capital Corporation, Natel's Air Conditioning and Heating, a proud sponsor of the St. Jude Dream Home, and Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House.